When Rachel Parent was 11 years old, she had to do a speech for her class. She decided to talk about food. When she began to research the food she was eating, the same food most of us eat, the standard fare of people in the industrialized world, she was horrified. She was particularly concerned about genetically modified foods and by the fact that consumers don't even get to know that they're eating such foods because Canada and the United States don't even require that food with GM ingredients be labeled. She began her own one-person crusade to get those foods labeled so that people can choose whether or not to eat them. She created a website and a movement called Kids Right to Know. Since then, she's reached literally millions of people around the world, speaking to enormous crowds, debating business spokesmen on national TV, being covered extensively in the media. Articulate and self-possessed, impassioned and charming, Rachel Parent has made a remarkable impact on the global debate about the benefits and dangers of industrial food. She's 16 years old. A GMO is a genetically modified organism and it's where they take DNA from one species and insert it into another to introduce a new trait. Now of course it sounds really complicated but there in reality are only two main traits that are commercialized. So the two main traits are pesticide producing and herbicide resistant. Pesticide producing is where they actually insert a pesticide directly into the seed that way when the plant grows and a bug tries to eat the plant its stomach will theoretically explode. And herbicide resistant is where the plant is engineered to withstand hundreds and hundreds of pounds of herbicides without killing the crop. Um, I think a lot of people actually get hybridization and GMOs confused. Um, and hybridization is something completely different. Um, it can happen in nature, it's just the natural process of breeding plants. Whereas GMOs is taking completely different species um, and combining them. So to give you an example, hybridization would be like mixing a dog and a dog. Whereas GMOs would be like mixing a dog and a cat, it just wouldn't happen. What's the, and what's the, the why? Why would you do that? Well, um, the companies, because these seeds have then been changed, they can patent them. And when they sell them to the farmers, they can then make profits off of them. Um, not only do they make profits one year, but the farmers can't save their seeds because they are patented and they have to continuously buy the seeds as, along with the pesticides, the herbicides, the extra fertilizers, year after year after year, making it much more costly for the farmers. So it's like a, it's like a um, financial treadmill for the farmer, right? Mm -hmm. well, why would the farmer do that? Well, um, there are many reasons. Some farmers are pro-biotech um, and other farmers are subject to cross-pollination. And this happens quite often. Um, plants in nature, they breed. Um, they pollinate. Bees carry pollen from one plant to another. And that's how we have the plants that we have. Um, without pollination, we wouldn't have produce. We wouldn't have our food. So naturally, um, other farms that are non-GMO become contaminated. And then Monsanto and the other biotech companies have to come in and they s either sue these farmers or take away their farm and land. So that's oftentimes what these farmers are subjected to. Now this is like the Percy Schmeisser case in Saskatchewan, right? Mm -hmm. I, touch on that one a little bit more because I think for most people this is, the, this is a quite outrageous, right? I mean, here's Percy Schmeisser farming near a GMO field and then what happens to him? Well, GMO pollen comes from one side of a different field and pollinates with his crops and of course then he ends up having to deal with the issues and getting charged for it and having his land taken away um, and having to go to court for it um, and it's really not fair to the farmers there's been many farmers who go through this there was a huge issue with Steve Marsh um, who's out in Australia actually and this was happening while I was in Australia uh, there was a huge court case and instead of suing um, the biotech company, he decided to sue the next door farmer. Um, and unfortunately, he ended up losing. But what this did was create a huge amount of awareness about this issue, and it affects hundreds and hundreds of farmers around the world. This is no longer just an issue of Canada or the US. This, this is global. Um, and that's why we all have to unite to fight against it. And the, the farmer who's actually the victim is, gets sued on the basis that he is infringing the patent of the, of the, uh, the seed company. That he was keeping seeds without buying them. And he did nothing. Yeah. 
Right? He did nothing. It, it, uh, it, the seeds. You, you would almost think that they could, that he could sue them for a field invasion or something of that kind. Well, exactly. Right? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Seems more logical. <laughs> it does, doesn't it? But it's a, it, it, it's an astonishing quirk in the law that a person can be the injured party and wind up being treated as the guilty party. Yeah. Right? Yeah. So all of this goes on, and and uh, so what the benefits are that either the seed produces its own pesticide and kills the bugs, or it's, it resists a, a sprayed pesticide mm -hmm. and thus survives to be, to be harvested. Um, but that wasn't the original promise of it, was it? This is the, the, you know, the original idea was that it would be beneficial not just to the company, because I mean, who cares about that, but beneficial to the, to the world, to the people. What were those benefits supposed to be? Well, uh, what they originally came out and said was that it would feed the world. Um, and that's even part of their slogan, um, helping to feed the world. But in reality, this is a complete myth. GMOs aren't engineered to have higher yields or to grow faster or to be drought resistant. Um, in fact, they require more water, they require more fertilizers, they require more pesticides. That goes into our soil, that goes into our water, that depletes the soil of its nutrients. Then people need to use more fertilizers, so it's more expensive. Um, on top of that, because GMOs are grown in multi, uh, monoculture, where it's all one crop for hundreds and hundreds of acres, it's more, um, it would be more like, easier for it to get diseases. Um, so then farmers not only have to deal with that, but they have to deal with the fact that it's more expensive for them. Mm. Now, did those, is this, a, are we talking here about a failure of a, where they set out to try and, and uh, build a beneficial seed, in effect, and fail to do it, or was it ever the intention to, to feed the world? I don't think the intention was really ever there to feed the world, um, because if their intention was to feed the world, the world would already be fed. This company makes billions of dollars a year, and if they wanted to solve global hunger, I mean, they could do it like that. Um, but instead, they've invested in trying to make these seeds patented and making them different and making sure that in the end they're making more profits. And, uh, now, uh, one of the things Kevin O'Leary basically said to you in that quite wonderful um, uh, encounter that you had with him, um, but one of the things was he basically accused you of not caring about, <coughs> about feeding the world. Mm -hmm. And, uh, and, but your response wasn't even to say that Monsanto could do it. You said, in effect, this is not the root anyway. Tell me what the root is. Well, the root issue is uh, lack of proper distribution. Um, and in reality, if a country wants to solve a hunger issue within their country, it starts with political issues. Um, that's, that's huge. Lack of distribution, lack of proper farming and irrigation, um, lack of helping or teaching farmers how to properly grow their seeds in sustainable and healthy ways for our environment so that it not only is good for them in the short term, but it's better for them in the long term. Uh, it helps the environment. When you help the environment, the environment helps you back. And the, the, uh, but the argument on the other side would be that, that even, with all the best, uh, even with all the best farming in the world, it won't be enough if you don't, if you don't have engineered seeds. But your contention was, was not just that, your contention was that poverty was really at the heart of it, right? Yep. Uh, poverty is a huge issue. And I mean, um, in reality, even if GMOs, they were sending it out to feed people, let's face it, GMOs, one third goes to animal feed. The other one third goes to junk food. And the last one third goes to ethanol um, and natural gas. None of this is going really to the people who need it. And even if it was, um, available for these people to buy it, if there's an issue of poverty, they wouldn't be able to afford it anyways. Um, so in reality, it's a vicious cycle, and these people are actually going into more and more debt by growing these GMO seeds. And a huge example of this is in India and South America. India, um, these Indian farmers are investing in genetically modified seeds because they think that the yields will be higher. And people have gone in and taught them about how the yields will be amazing and they'll make more funny, uh, money for their families. Um, but then they grow these seeds and they get diseases, the yields fail, um, pests become resistant to it and they eat all their crops and the farmers end up with nothing. And by Indian law, if a farmer commits suicide, um, the debt isn't passed on to their family. And so we've had 250,000 farmers 
commit suicide. And that's about one farmer every 30 minutes. So just picture that, one farmer every 30 minutes every day for the entire year, and GMOs have been out 20 years now. So, I mean, this is a huge, huge issue, and the issue was with that is that without the main farmer, oftentimes these families go more and more into debt. Um, and this is just a vicious cycle of poverty. And the same thing is happening in Argentina and South America. Uh, people are being devastated by this. Uh, GMOs are actually one of the leading causes of why our rainforests are being cut down. So we're having natives being dislocated. Um, and we have people who are going into more and more debt. And it's just increasing the cycle of poverty. The story of the Indian farmers, I was aware of, and, and the irony is that they generally commit suicide by drinking pesticides. Right? Mm -hmm. um, but the thing, the missing link that you've just provided is I didn't realize that the reason for them to do that was that the debt was, in effect, canceled by their, yep. by their deaths. Um, and so presumably you're not getting the same effect in other countries, uh, where presumably the debt would just kept go on to the family, so there's no... In a sense, there's no benefit to committing suicide, is an awful way to phrase it, but that's, yep. yeah, that's uh, In South America, we don't see as many suicides, but we do see a lot of families in poverty, um, and they just simply can't get out. They can't afford food anymore. Um, and again, it's just ever-growing poverty because of the agricultural issues, um, and it's become so industrial, but people can't keep up with it. Um, and especially when farming is your entire livelihood, if your crops fail, you're done. Mm -hmm. um, so that's what they're facing. Mm. Um, the other area where there's a, there's a consider big issue is testing, right? So tell me how this stuff gets tested and, and, uh, um, and who's responsible for that and what confidence you have in the tests. All right, so neither Health Canada nor the FDA do any independent testing themselves. Um, and I've actually verified that with them. Um, I had a meeting with the Minister of Health here in Canada um, and we did talk about GMOs and GMO labeling and through, I mean, the meeting went very well, um, but during the entire thing she, she did say, I'm not a figurehead, but I'm not responsible for this. I don't have the mandate to be able to label GMOs. Um, so that was, of course, a huge eye-opener, and I asked, you know, who is responsible if you're not? Um, and she said, well, the Health Canada officials. Um, so she passed me on and she arranged a meeting for that. And health but, but don't they report to her? Yeah. I mean, the buck stops with her, all the same, right? Yes and no. So <laughs> when I had the meeting with them, um, they also said the same thing. They said that they don't have the mandate to label GMOs either. So here I am, I'm sitting here kind of confused going, so who does have the mandate? Um, if our Minister of Health doesn't and the Health Canada officials and scientists don't, who does? And they said, well, maybe the CFIA, which is the Canadian Food Inspection Agency, but you know, they probably wouldn't want to do that anyways. Um, so in reality, our system is all based off of what the corporations want right now. And that's the truth, I mean, the corporations are responsible for testing, and our Minister of Health said that as well. Um, she said that it's all based on the corporation's tests. The corporations do a maximum of 90-day testing, so that's three months. Um, and that's not nearly enough to say whether there's health or environmental issues that could be happening long-term. And there have been no long-term studies to prove that they are safe. But there have been long-term studies to prove that there have been associated health issues. Now, how does that happen, that, the, that you have no health, or are you saying there have been a number of, of long-term studies, mm -hmm. none of which has said these things are yep. safe, some of which have said these things are dangerous, yep. is that correct? Yep. Dangerous in what way? What, what, are, what are the adverse effects? That they've been linked to allergies, digestive disorders, organ damage, even things like tumors, and of course, I'm no scientist, and <laughs> we know that. Uh, I'm Maybe 16. <laughs> I don't have a degree yet. <laughs> but... Um, I think the key part is that um, I grew up having allergies all my life and I know so many people that have allergies and it's hard to link or to find what's causing these allergies if we don't even know what's going into our food. GMOs could be causing the allergies but because it's not labeled you can't link it back to that. 
Um, and that's a key part of why we want labeling is that for everybody who has allergies or health issues, um, it would be really great for them to be able to track what exactly their food has in it and where it's coming from. Yeah, and if I try not eating this kind of food for a while and the allergy disappears, then for me anyway, I've done a satisfactory test there. Um, and there seems to be a great deal more of that kind of, uh, allergies have to be an environmental illness, they're triggered by an outside um, phenomenon of some kind, right? Yep. Um, that brings us then right to labeling, and, and <laughs> in a way by going back around through, through Ronald Ambrose. I mean, it's quite startling that nobody there thinks they have the authority to do it. Mm -hmm. and I suppose it would have to be uh, the Prime Minister in the Cabinet and directing the Health Department to do it, which is, doesn't seem like it's likely to happen. Well, actually speaking of politics, there is a motion called M480, um, and that is to label GMOs. It was brought forth by the official um, opposition, so the NDPs and their health critic, which is um, Murray Rankin, and he brought this forth. And as soon as the elections pass by, they'll bring it forward as a bill, um, and it will be to label GMOs. So if we can get um, the parties to all be on board, then we could possibly have GMO labeling as soon as possible. So where are the parties on this? Um, NDPs are supportive of GMO labeling. Um, of course, the Green parties are supportive. <laughs> Um, the Conservatives, they have no interest um, and they have a lot of lobbyists within the, the party. I mean, even look at the environment, uh, the agricultural minister, Jerry Ritz, mm -hmm. uh, he's come out and said that, you know, he spends his days trying to debunk um, bad things about GMOs, things that say that GMOs aren't safe. Well, that's not his job as an agricultural minister. Um, he's supposed to be ensuring that they are safe for us and looking at all the evidence. Um, so that, obviously, they really have no interest in labeling GMOs. Um, and I did ask the Liberals. I asked Justin Trudeau if he would label GMOs to support our Canadian right to know. Um, and he gave a very vague response, saying that, of course, he supports the right to know, but he didn't come out and say he would label GMOs if he came into power. So he's still in question. Okay, so we've got a spectrum here from no from the Conservatives. Mm, Maybe. From the Liberals, right? Yeah. <laughs> yes, from the NDP and the Greens, right? Mm -hmm. Jerry Ritzy, and Jerry Ritz actually, I have a quote here that I, I, I was absolutely startled by. Mandatory GM labeling is an ill-informed, ideologically driven proposal that would increase red tape on businesses, decimate Canadian farmers, and drastically increase costs for Canadian consumers, right? Yeah. Is any of that true? Of course not. <laughs> <laughs> um, he, he, a lot of people who are um, pro GMO and who don't want labeling use the excuse that GMO labeling would cost a lot of money for Canadian consumers. And this is completely false. Um, in fact, it would cost nothing. I mean, look at when we had to label trans fats. We didn't see an extra cost. It was absolutely free. Um, and on top of that, companies are constantly changing labels, new and improved, now with, um, omega-3 enhanced. They, they always have new packaging coming out, so adding an extra label costs nothing. Um, and on top of that, it's not about fear-mongering or trying to scare the public into buying certain foods and not trying to buy certain foods. It's simply a reality of being able to choose as a consumer what we're putting in our bodies. Because after all, we live in a country where, thank goodness, we can choose our own elected officials, but we can't even choose the simple right to know what we are eating. And so that's what has to change. Um, and it's not about scaring people. It's just the democratic right to know what's in our food. Well, you've made the point elsewhere that, that, um, that this kind of label changing happens all the time mm -hmm. and uneventfully, right? So why, so what are they so scared of with this stuff? There's, why are they so, I mean, that's a really intemperate statement from the, he's not sort of saying, well, I don't really think so or I don't really see this. No, no, he's saying this is absolutely wrong on a whole bunch of, you know, of levels and it's quite bombastic. Why, are, why is he so fierce about it? Why is the industry so fierce about it? What are they really scared of? I think they're scared of their sales dropping. Um, and 
this happened in Europe. Um, Euro the European Union has GMO labeling. Um, and as soon as GMO labeling was implemented, people started to research because they saw the sign GMO and they go, I wonder what a GMO is. So they start to research, they find out more about it, they find out what it could potentially do to their health, what it is doing to the environment, um, and they try and cut it out of their diet. And of course, this means a drop in sales. And I think what they're really scared of is they're already losing sales. Their stocks have been going down like crazy. Um, their stocks were at 126, they're at 85 now. Um, and they're seeing huge declines in stocks. Um, so I think the change is already starting to happen and they're becoming more and more worried about what will happen um, as soon as we do see GMO labeling. You think they're worried about that, that at some point, the, the nightmare you know, for someone of my generation is DDT mm -hmm. and thalidomide. Those two are the, are the big sort of scary stories. Do you think that they may be worried about the fact that there may be, not will be necessarily, but may be something like that in the offing, and that ultimately they're going to wind up with people suing them um, for, what they've, uh, for what they've put in the food and for the impacts of it? It's a possibility, and I mean, I think they're also a little nervous right now um, because the study from the WHO came out about glyphosate, which is the main ingredient used in their herbicide Roundup. Um, and Roundup is used liberally on almost all GMO crops. It's, it's huge and it's just come out from the WHO that it is a, pos a probable car uh, carcinogen and it's probably causing cancer in humans. Um, and so now they've, they've really awakened a lot of people and people are starting to be more and more concerned about glyphosate and it's long-term imp uh, long impacts on us, and it's been on the market for 20 years now. Um, people have been ingesting this for 20 years, so what is it going to do to them in a few years down the road? Um, so I think a lot of people are really upset about that, and they're starting to really see the impacts of that. And the, glypho or the, uh, the GMOs are really glyphosate enablers, right? I mean, they're, they're the things that call for and, and really evoke for it. Sure. Yeah. yeah, and it sounds like a really scary chemical. Mm -hmm. okay. Yeah. Um, tell me about the Dark Act, because that's, a, and again, I'm, I'm, I'm really interested in, in this heavy resistance to doing something that seems very straightforward, you know? Yeah, the Dark Act was put into place, it was practically written by Monsanto, let's face it, um, and the other biotech companies, and it's a lot like um, the Monsanto Protection Act, which uh, was also a bill that came out a while ago, um, very similar, um, and so what it is basically um, is it doesn't allow a country or s individual states to have GMO labeling. Um, and it's to protect themselves um, because they, they really don't want people to be able to choose for themselves. And that's an American law mm -hmm. that applies to the United States, right? Yeah. yeah. And the, but now, on the other hand, there are a lot of countries, you've mentioned the European Union, but, but there are quite a few countries now that do have this labeling, right? Yep. Hmm. There's 64 countries around the world, so um, it's huge. And I mean, l Canada and the US are the only two industrialized nations in the entire world that don't require mandatory GMO labeling. Really? So that, that has to say something, you know? I mean, just uh, this week, France banned GMOs, Russia banned GMOs. There's about five or six co uh, countries that completely banned them. Um, and they obviously know something that we don't. Um, and so that's what we have to work towards. I mean, labeling is definitely our first step. Mm. But you're actually opposed to genetic modifications more or less across the board, right? I mean, if genetic modification um, was good for our environment, if it didn't infringe upon nature, if you weren't patenting nature and rechanging it, um, I mean, then if it could do positive for the world, maybe, but at the moment, it's destroying our ecosystems, it's destroying our health. Um, other countries don't want it. And I mean, that's a huge warning sign. If other countries don't want it, um, including China and Russia, if countries like that don't want it, then why are we taking it? Um, so that's what we have to ask ourselves. And is, is patenting nature and changing it the right thing to do? 
And I think it's a moral and ethical question that we all have to ask ourselves. It's a question Van Dana Shiva has been very, you know, very articulate about. Huh? So what's the situation with China and Russia? They've, they've, they've now gone for labeling or banning, for banning GMOs? Um, China has labeling GMOs and Russia just came out and banned it. Okay. So, yeah, what do they know that we don't? Um, uh, okay, now we're concerned. Thus far, we've been talking about plants, and it's been only it's been a f uh, its major impact has been well, its entire impact has been in plants, hasn't it? And, uh, but now we're talking about GM animals. Tell me about that. Well, um, a few years ago, they had the Enviro pig. Um, so this was a pig that would produce less waste, um, and a lot of people came out and stood up against it, and we got rid of it. Never came to market. Thank goodness. Um, now, we're starting to see the GMO salmon, and this is a huge, huge issue. Um, with the GMO salmon, there's so many environmental risks that could possibly ensue. Like, for instance, if a genetically modified salmon went out into our local streams or rivers and somehow bred with our normal fish, there would be a chance of all these salmon becoming genetically modified. Now, they do put them through sterilization, but this only works for about 95% of the fish. So 5% are still fertile, and that 5% can wreak havoc with all the natural fish. Um, on top of that, they're more aggressive, um, and they could outnumber the other fish. They could also go for food more than the other fish, the natural fish, um, fight for breeding spots more. So, I mean, there's a lot of environmental damages that could happen with this. Mm. As it happens, Chris and I have done a film that you may have heard of called Salmon Wars. Mm -hmm. and it's about aquaculture and, and open net pen salmon farming. Mm -hmm. um, and, and what you've described is exactly what we're actually seeing from the salmon that are in those pens who have been bred to, you know, been selectively bred. They haven't been genetically modified, but they've been selectively bred to prosper and thrive in, in this very odd circumstance. When they get out, you've described exactly what they do. They're more aggressive. They do interbreed. They, you know, uh, dilute the genetic stock of the existing thing. But the GMO ones sound as though they, could, they are much more uh, scary kind of fish. Oh, they're, they're big too. Um, they've been uh, genetically modified to be growing much faster and they grow much bigger. Um, and with that, of course, they're more aggressive. They can fight for more food, they can fight for the breeding spots, they can kill off the other salmon, they can breed with it, so then they're all genetically modified. So it just, it's a terrible issue to be faced with. And I mean, um, nature is a beautiful thing. I mean, we're all a part of nature. It's not just the animals and the plants. Every single one of us is part of a thriving ecosystem. Um, but by throwing one thing off, you throw everything else off. And um, this could affect natives. Uh, this could affect other animals, such as bears, who rely on salmon. Um, so it's just, it's a domino effect. Well, where are we on that one? How, 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 uh, how close are we to actually seeing the, those salmon um, bred and, and, and delivered to our tables? It still has to be fully approved. It hasn't been... 100% um, it's on hold right now, but uh, it's, it's probably pretty close. And that's why it's so urgent that everybody gets out there and sign petitions, tell your friends and your family, um, call your local member of parliament, um, get them to start discussing this issue because it really does affect us all on so many levels. Mm -hmm. And, and, and you, so you think it could be headed off as the Enviro pig was, provided there was enough uh, outrage about it. Yeah. But of course, pigs are sort of a little closer to us in a way. I mean, fish are, are I think for most people, seem like they're cold-blooded animals that live in a, for an environment that's foreign to us and we really don't have uh, very much in common with them. So harder to, harder to rouse the troops over, the, over a salmon, I think, than a, than a pig. Right? I think why people are so outraged about it um, is more about what it could do to our ecosystems and how in the future we could have just all genetically modified salmon. Um, my kids may never grow up with natural salmon. Um, they may never be able to go out to a lake and see a, a normal natural salmon that I would have been able to see. Um, they'll see genetically modified salmon and I think 
that's really touched the hearts of a lot of people, knowing that our lakes, our rivers, our oceans may never be the same again. Um, and it's not the same as a product that got messed up and can be recalled. Once this is out in nature, there's no recalling it. Um, and so that's why so many people are becoming so outraged about this. Because, yeah, we may not be close with a fish, um, but this fish impacts so much more than just our diet. Um, it impacts other fish, it impacts our, our entire ecosystem. So mm -hmm. that's, that's really why people are outraged about it. Mm. Who's behind it? Because it, it's, it, there's a little company called Aqua Bounty that I think has been yeah. creating it in Prince Edward Island and growing it out in Panama. Yeah. Um, that's not a very big company, but it feels like there's really big pressure behind it. Do you know anything about that? Um, I don't know as much as I would like to, but as far as I know, it is Aqua Bounty. Mm -hmm. um, and of course, I'm sure that they have the support of Monsanto and the other biotech companies. I mean, they're all in it together. Mm. Um, they may be competitors, but anything genetically modified is right up their alley. Mm. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm sure that they have enough funds um, themselves and the support from the other biotech companies. Yeah. You talk about your children, that's a nice segue into the other thing I wanted to talk about, which is you started on this when you were in grade six? Yep. Um, I know you've told the story before, but would you tell me again? <laughs> yeah, sure. Um, I had to do a speech while I was in grade six, and I didn't know what to do it on. Um, and it was a class project, and everybody was doing it on things like my trip skiing, um, my dog and how I got my dog or what, why I named my dog the name it has and I just <laughs> I wanted to do something a little bit deeper. Um, I wanted to do something that would touch everybody in the audience in a way that the name of someone's dog couldn't. Um, and so I decided to research our food system and actually I had a whole list of topics that I was really passionate about ranging from deforestation to poverty, um, animal cruelty, um, and of course our food system and through researching our food system I found out about GMOs um, and when I found out that none of my peers knew what a GMO was and that there were so many health and environmental issues at that point I was I was shocked and I knew I wanted to do something um, because I figured that something had to be done someone had to do it and through realization I realized that I could be that person I could do something and I didn't have to wait for somebody else to take action because if I waited nobody else would. Um, so it all started with a Twitter account um, and at first I was completely opposed to social media. Um, I was like no, everyone wastes their time on it, they just post selfies and um, it's just pointless but I realized that it could be a very valuable tool. Um, to reach people not only in Canada but around the world for support. Um, and that's such an incredible tool that we have access to right now. If it's used in the right way, it's amazing. It's not the solution, but it can help. Um, and then it moved on to doing a march. Uh, my first march was a Kids Right to Know march. I uh, got about 400 people out, um, which was very exciting for a 12-year-old, um, you know, to get 400 on their first try. Um, a little bit before that, my first speech for public was for a huge audience of 12 people. And, um, <laughs> you know, things just grew and grew. was invited to speak for the March Against Monsanto. There was 4,000, and then We Day, which was 22,000, and um, then debated Kevin O'Leary, which has about 5.5 million views on YouTube right now. And so things just blew up, and um, I've definitely been blessed with this opportunity. Um, and it really touches my heart knowing that there are so many kids out there who possibly might have health issues or um, the environment that they live in might be affected because of this. And that's why I think it's so important that people get out there and try to make a difference. There's two kind of key points or kind of key moments there. One of them is, is when you realize how serious this problem is. And the second one is when you realize that you could be the person and you're 11. <laughs> right? you, know, you could be the person that actually does something about this. I'm curious, your family's in the food business. Um, do you think you were particularly sensitive to this because of the environment you grew up in around the, sort of the, the, around the non-modified dinner table? Right? I get asked that a lot actually and 
Not at all. Mm. Honestly, I ate GMOs up until I was 11 or 12. Completely. We were the typical family. Shop at Costco. Um, eat all the samples there. <laughs> you know, go there for lunch or dinner and just eat everything. Um, and I think that's why it was such an eye-opener is that I had no clue about it before. And knowing that only about 20% of Canadians at that point knew about GMOs, um, that was a huge eye-opener because I didn't have anyone to teach me about it. Um, and what I actually later found out, which is really neat, is that my grandma um, in the early 90s had been involved in trying to stop GMOs. And then that topic was never passed on to the rest of my family. We never, never talked about it. We never um, learned anything about it. I had never heard the word until I was 12. Um, and that was simply because I just decided to research our food system and it came up. Yeah. Wow, that's fascinating. So yeah. it's a revelation about your own behavior, among other things, right? That you, yeah. you were you know, as much enmeshed in this as anybody else. Right? Yeah. yeah. So how do you, how come you made that second step? Because I think that's, you know, we are always being told that young people are apathetic and, you know, they don't feel engaged and, and you know, all the rest of that, that stuff. But every now and again, somebody comes along who does take that extra step and says, I may, not, I may not be an adult, but it doesn't mean I don't have influence, authority, power, you know, the ability to make a difference. Where's that come from? Any idea? I don't think personally, uh, that any youth um, is apathetic towards any issue. Um, I think that everybody does have a deep sense of what's right and wrong. Um, no matter what your age, you could, be, you could be three, or you could be 50, or you could be 80 or 90 or 10. It doesn't matter what your age is. Um, I think we all have a deep sense of what's right and wrong. and. Everyone wants to make a difference in the world. Everyone wants to do what's right for our planet. I think the issue is, is that a lot of us don't know how. Um, don't know how to make the first step, uh, how to get involved, or they think I'm too busy, like, you know, you can't make a difference because I have too much homework right now. Or, um, but you don't have to go out and start your own organization, or you don't have to go out and um, sign petitions all the time, even just making small choices from home. That makes a huge difference. Uh, growing your own garden, that can change a lot of things. I mean, that not only changes your diet, but um, that reconnects you with nature and our soil and our water and um, what we are truly meant to do. And so I think fundamentally, um, everybody has that sense of I have to make a difference. It's just about actually getting out there and taking action. There's got to be a certain, I would think, a large component of fear too. That you know, I'm scared if I kind of get out in front and and I, you know, what if I make a fool of myself and I don't know enough not to make a fool of myself and so forth. How do you get over that? Because it must still come up for you. Right? <laughs> <laughs> um, I've gotten to the point where I don't care what people think anymore. <laughs> I do what I do, and that's and if they don't agree, they don't agree. Um, but, I mean, we got so many letters of support um, around the world. Um, for every negative comment, we get a hundred positive comments. Um, and I think for everybody out there who may be watching this, um, don't ever feel like you're going to make a fool of yourself. Go out there and try something new. Um, try standing up for what you're passionate about because that's so key. Um, not only for yourself, but for us, the future generations. We have to stand up for our future because after all, we may be making mistakes now in our generation, but us and the future generations are the ones who are going to have to deal with these consequences. So that's why we have to make a difference now while we still can. Yeah, I often think of that, that, that um, uh, you know, for someone my age, um, I don't have a whole, I mean, I'm, I'm not on the edge of the grave, but I'm also, I know that I've got a lot more time behind me than I do in front of me. And, and I, so I recognize that they're, it's your generation that's really going to have to live with the consequences of what we do now. And you'd think it would motivate younger people as they look around and see it, but it seems to drive a lot of them into, into a kind of a, um, yeah, and I'm too small, I, you know, we can't make a difference, and so on and so forth. And uh, uh, you know, I agree with you, absolutely, absolutely incorrect, but I can understand that. Yeah, that yeah. I can totally understand, and we, we live in a world with so many issues right now um, that it's overwhelming. 
And I think that's why people are driven into apathy. And it, it's not necessarily apathy, but it's almost like I, I don't want to hear it because it's too much. Um, I, I just don't want to hear it. And I've seen that. A lot of people say, just don't tell me what's in my food because I just want to enjoy it. Um, <laughs> but what they're not realizing is that every bite they take is making an influence on the world because they're not bridging the gap between where their food came from and where it was grown. Um, every time I take a bite of food, I think about, okay, so this had to be shipped from, let's say, California. And there's a farmer there, and that farmer had to grow it. And if it's organic, if it's not organic, if they use pesticides, um, if the pesticides are contributing to the dying off of our bees and our butterflies. Um, I mean, there's so much more than just that one bite of food that we take that we have to think about. And I, I often use this line is that every morning when we wake up, we do have an opportunity to make the world a better place or a worse place. Um, and whether that be through the choices that we make, uh, through food or clothing, we all have that opportunity, but it's up to you to decide what side you're gonna choose. Um, so that's, that's a key component, I think. Mm -hmm. So once you've got the ball rolling, though, you've obviously had a lot of people that have come forward to support you one way or another. Tell me a little bit about how that works. I mean, a website as, as sophisticated and effective as yours doesn't happen by accident, right? No. Um, <laughs> it started off with uh, almost like a blog-style website. Um, and through the years, we've slowly gathered small amounts of funds. We're still very, very low, um, but enough to kind of recreate our website. Still needs work. Um, but we, what we want to do is get the best information and the most information out there possible, not only about the issue of GMOs, but the solutions and what each and every person can do um, to get in touch with nature and to help the GMO uh, labeling issue. So that's what our whole website is built on. And um, we've also built up quite the social media over the past couple of years, which has been amazing. Um, it's an incredible tool, it really is, and I'm, I'm glad that we have it. Um, if it's used the right way, it's amazing. I know a lot of people don't use it the right way, and that's okay, but it'll come a time where they, they will use it, and um, it, it makes such a difference. You can contact hundreds and thousands of people in an instant, and it could be in Africa to South America, the U.S., anywhere, and you can spread that message. When you say we, you're talking about the, the Kids' Right to Know group. Right? How big is that group? We have a core team of about 12 people. Um, we're a very small organization um, with a big reach. And uh, yeah, so we all work on our own little parts. Um, and we all pitch in our best. Um, we're all volunteers. And yeah, it's been, it's been great. I'm so thankful for all of them. Mm. It's a brilliant phrase, too. I mean, I think that that's got to affect more or less any kid who sees it. Kids' right to know. Yeah, I have a right to know. That would, that would really, that's a motivating sort of phrase, isn't it? Yeah, yeah for sure. Yeah, yeah. Uh, one last one, I guess, that, that um, you've been all over the world now, and you've met all kinds of inspiring people. Um, any experiences of that kind that stand out for you that you'd want to share with other people? Um, I love Vandana Shiva. Um, and she's an incredible mentor of mine. Um, I've had an amazing opportunity to spend a few a week with her, and we we often speak in different events together. Um, and going to India, um, I went there for a course of hers, and it was all about Earth democracy and um, our food democracy, and really living the life of Gandhi, making a difference, um, and. I think one of the key things I learned on that trip was that um, fighting for global peace is very important, um, but the key steps to achieving that are being in harmony with our soil and our water, our ecosystems, our local communities. Um, and that's the first step to achieving peace. So um, that was definitely something that really stood out for me. Um, another thing was Another person that really inspired me was Patch Adams, um, who I had an amazing opportunity to spend four days with him. Um, and he's an amazing guy. He's so funny. Um, 
And what he taught us was that uh, happiness and joy and laughter is m so healing. Um, and through those four days, I never felt better. He, he made us all laugh and um, to the point where we were crying because we were laughing so hard. Um, and he's just an incredible person. So I really held on to that throughout these years. You have a wonderful sunny demeanor. Maybe you, know, <laughs> <laughs> you obviously must have resonated with, uh, with someone like Patch Adams very strongly. Oh yeah, for sure. Yeah, and uh, the you know the other thing that occurs to me from something you just said is is we've now done about eighty of these interviews, and we've done them with people like Vandana Shiva and and we haven't done Patch Adams, but uh, but a lot of really outstanding people. And if there's one figure that lies behind a whole range of them that comes up in conversations, I was startled to hear it coming up here again here, it's Gandhi. Yeah. Gandhi is just such a towering presence in so much that's positive about the world. It's, it's quite stunning to me. Mm -hmm. yeah. I think he's a role model for all activists. Um, he got out there despite everything to make a difference, no matter what anybody thought about him. Um, he went out there and did his best. And I think that's so key is that, yeah, individually, we all have incredible power to make a difference. Um, but what he, what he brought forth was just to try your best um, and to stand up for what's right. And I think that's so key because I think social, we're all socially responsible. Uh, we all have to become socially responsible and take action on these issues. Agriculture really touches me. Um, it can either ruin the world or it can save it. Um, and by giving back to our environment, that's, that's the best thing we can do because, um, I forget who said this quote, but this quote really touched me. It says, our earth is a loving mother. She gives us everything we need as long as we cultivate her soil with love and peace. And I wholeheartedly believe that's true. Uh, we really have to start giving back to Mother Nature um, and start embracing it for all that she does for us. Mm. He's left us with some lovely little aphorisms like, uh, you know, first they ignore you, uh, yeah. then, then they, they laugh at you, then they laugh at you, then they fight you, then you win. Yeah. <laughs> True. Yep. Exactly. And we're at the fighting stage now. They're fighting us, so I guess we're close to winning. <laughs> Rachel Parent an internationally recognized food activist who has achieved more in her first 16 years than most people do in a lifetime. If you're also concerned about our food supply and about the environmental impact of industrial agriculture, you may want to look at our interviews with Mohamed Hage, developer of the world's first commercial rooftop farm, Brian Brett, poet and author of the book Trauma Farm, A Rebel History of Rural Life, and Vandana Shiva, founder of Navdanya, a movement created to protect the diversity and integrity of living resources and to oppose what she calls the colonization of life itself. For The Green Interview, I'm Silver Donald Cameron. Thanks for watching.